Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help as we give our attention to studying His Word together. Our good and gracious God, we, we thank You that in Your kind providence, You have not only made Yourself known to us, but You have caused those, that revelation to be written down, that we can study it, memorize it, hide Your Word in our heart that we might not sin against You. We pray that you will give us understanding as we open together uh, Paul's letter to the Colossian church, that you will help us to see not only the instructions to an ancient people, but to see your instructions to us here at GFBC Conroe, how we might respond as a church body, how we might respond as individual men and women and boys and girls to the word of life. We ask for the gift of understanding. We ask for the conviction of our sin. We ask for the comfort of the gospel of our Savior. We ask this by His authority and for the good of all of your people. Amen. Take your seat, please, and turn with me to Colossians chapter 2 once again. In a moment, we'll be considering together verses 9 through 15. I'm sorry, 8 through 15. A man by the name of Lee Min Bok 60 years old, was a researcher at North Korea's Academy of Agricultural Science. He had once before made an unsuccessful attempt to flee North Korea. But in 1991, he was able to escape North Korea and eventually make his way to South Korea in 1995. And in an interview, he made some very interesting observations. <laughs> He said, and I quote, I have a bit of an academic side. According to Kim Il-sung's teaching, people are supposed to keep diaries. Everyone in North Korea should strictly follow Kim Il-sung's teaching, so I did as I was supposed to, and I kept a diary. Even though Kim Il-sung is a villain here in South Korea, in North Korea, he's above everything. We learned that he studied well and gave our lives purpose. I lived according to those teachings, I wrote these diaries out of a loyalty to the leader. That was our ideology, and I lived my life in strict adherence to it. No one could think differently. I got hold of my diaries 10 years after I arrived in South Korea. I had been sending money to my family in the north, and they sent them to me. I didn't write any complaints in my diaries. I, wouldn't, I would have been in big trouble if I did. My diaries are a record of of my history in North Korea. I am thinking about turning these diaries into a book. I'd like to publish a book about how to change North Koreans' thinking when unification happens. Now listen to this last statement. These diaries show how North Koreans think and how their minds are constructed. People need to make these into a textbook because they need proof. Imagine, it's hard for us to understand, even to imagine the inner thought life of someone who's never known anything other than totalitarian rule, who's never known freedom, who's never known what it's like to think according to the scriptures, who's never known what it's like to even think his own thoughts or to think simply for the welfare of himself or his own family, but to think only through the gear of what the dear leader wants me to do. But it's equally difficult for a person who has never known freedom to comprehend what life was like, what life is like as a free man. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 15, and really the remainder of chapter 2, the scriptures invite us to meditate upon our freedom in Christ. There's a, there's a call to meditate and to think about what, is, what does freedom really look like? What's involved in Christian liberty? And, and it's also to contemplate the very serious possibility of submitting ourselves once again to the bondage of human traditions, to the tyranny of man-made religion, instead of resting in the work, the finished work of our Savior. Verses 9 to 15 give us this, this beautiful, give us beautiful and, and awesome images. There are, 
There are metaphors here. There are allusions to the Old Testament. There's a rich tapestry. In fact, every single one of these phrases could be a sermon, a separate sermon, or a series of sermons even. And every sermon, is, is, as I prepare, there, every sermon has its own unique difficulties. Sometimes, I'm, as I labor through a text, the, the difficulty is exegetical, where I'm working through the text and trying to figure out what exactly does this word mean in its context. Sometimes the, the struggle is organizational. How do I make this, these points clear and, and connect things together in such a way that the one main idea the Holy Spirit is teaching will come across? Well, in, in this particular text, the difficulty is there's so much here that the temptation is to give a detailed exposition of every word and phrase in verses 9 to 15 in particular. And in a sense, as the metaphor goes, you lose the forest for the trees. Keep in mind, this was originally a letter. Uh, you know, on my, my Bible app, if I go and, and, and play it at normal speed, I think it's just a little over 10 minutes to, to listen aloud to the entire letter. It's not a long letter. And one of the, the hazards that we, that we run into is if we, there's, there's so much detail and there's so much rich treasure here that if we seek to mine every bit of it, we lose the, the narrative. We lose the letter as a whole. And this section in particular, Paul's driving home a point. And we're still going to break it up because we're going to spend several weeks here in chapter 2. But we could spend months just in verses 9 to 15. It's that good. It's that rich. And I would commend it to you. Um, in fact, I, at the end of the sermon, I'll do it again. I will commend to you even the memorization of this passage. It's, it's rich. It ought to be a deep treasure to each one of us. But I don't want to break up the flow of the letter. So as we think about this letter that was read aloud, and Paul gave instructions, after you've read it, send it on to the church at Laodicea, and then I wrote a letter to them also, I want you to get that letter and read that one in your midst. So this letter was designed to be read and then passed, passed on. So I'm going to give this disclaimer at the outset. I'm not going to parse every word in the passage. Just full disclosure. Um, I want instead to consider together the, the big picture of the Apostle's instruction here between verses 8 and 15. The title of today's sermon is Avoid the World's Chains. Avoid the World's Chains. And I'm going to organize this with, with three headings. Uh, first is, is the threat of captivity. Paul gives a warning, and it's a bona fide, very serious warning. There's a threat of captivity that he wants the Colossian church, and by extension wants us to avoid. Secondly, we need to understand the picture of freedom. Just as the man in North Korea had no concept of what freedom is, and even years later, 10 years after his, his leaving North Korea, he goes back and reads his own diaries with a sense of, this is how I was thinking back then. You ever had that experience as a believer? And you go back and you think back through your experiences and your thoughts as a lost person. That's how I used to think. My, my thinking was so disordered. But you couldn't comprehend what freedom was like. And then thirdly, the key to freedom. The key to freedom. So I'm going to back up and read from verse 1 down to verse 15. Bear in mind, our, our focus today will be verses 8 to 15. So let's hear now together the word of the living God. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your Christian faith of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elementary or the elemental principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, 
and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. Let's consider in the first place a real threat of captivity. There's a real threat here. There's a bona fide, very serious warning. Paul says in verse 8, see to it. This this is a, a summons to our full attention, our careful thought and consideration. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, the Bible often uses the metaphor of captivity or the metaphor of slavery to indicate our being in bondage to sin. This is a picture of lostness. I mean, we can go back into the narrative of of the Exodus. Here, the people of Israel, the people of God, had been in bondage, severe slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and God, by his mighty hand and outstretched arm, delivered them from the clutches of Egypt and even spared allowed them to spoil the people of Egypt on their way out. And that becomes a metaphor throughout the Bible of God's delivering his people from sin, from their sinful condition. For example, in Romans 6, Paul uses the phrases slaves of sin. He says set free from sin. And he uses the phrase slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. And he's speaking there about the lostness of the human condition. That by nature, as sons and daughters of Adam, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. And in that sense, we are captives. We are in bondage. We are slaves to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, he was interacting with the Jews, and they were saying, what do you mean? What do you mean, slaves? We're sons of Abraham. We've never been slaves of anyone. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And he goes on and talks to them about their unbelief. This is the picture of the unbelieving world is a picture of in bondage, in captivity. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is explaining to Timothy how the Lord's servant, how a pastor must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So again, Paul's using this image of saying, perhaps by, by, the, by the faithfulness of the messenger and his gentle demeanor, some might be persuaded to hear the truth and by means of the gospel will be set free from the bondage and the tyranny of sin. So we, we have a well-developed picture. And I can give you more and more examples, but I think you get the point. There's, been, there's a number of places where the scripture that talks about this captivity in that way. The Bible plainly teaches that sin and our depraved natural condition are bondage. We're born that way. But in Christ, we've been set free. Now, the message here, can this, this metaphor of captivity, can be, can be taken in that way, and often it is. The question is, is Paul using it in the same way here? And the answer is no. He's speaking of captivity in a different way. Um, Paul is not here warning the Colossians that they might be taken back again to their original captivity in their fallen condition. That's not what he's saying. Paul's not saying, be careful or you can lose your salvation. That you can become captive to the devil again. And I know you were transferred, he said in verse 13 of chapter 1, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Is Paul saying, if you're not careful, you can be taken back into the kingdom of darkness? No. That's not at all what he's saying. He means something entirely different here by captivity. So we need to understand what he means, first of all, by the captivity. What's the nature of the captivity about which Paul speaks? 
Now, the context here does not make this really an evangelistic text. This is a text to believers. He's writing a warning to those who are Christians, those who, he's already said, your faith is firm. He's, in fact, you're bearing fruit. You're growing, I'm, and he rejoices in that. That's his audience. So this is not writing to unbelievers saying, come out of bondage. He's saying to believers, don't let yourself be caught up and taken captive by certain philosophies and empty deception. There exists, however, for believers, a real Danger. So we need to think about what this captivity is that Paul has in mind here. And Paul does not want his brothers and sisters in Christ, whom he's, he dearly loves. He's expressed his love and affection for them, even though he's never met them face to face. He loves them as brothers and sisters in the Lord, and he does not want them to be caught up, to be taken captive by these things. By the, by the empty deceptions and the philosophies of asceticism legalism, mysticism, and other practices, and all of which have the effect of holding them in bondage contrary to the freedom that was purchased for them in Christ. And we're going to see throughout the rest of chapter 2, there are, are two more warnings that are going to follow this one regarding these, these, this commitment to these outward things, these philosophies and empty deception. So he's setting the table for that. Now, I have to, uh, to, to kind of hasten to add, it's not all philosophy that Paul is, is, is opposed to. Paul is not saying that anything that any man has ever come up with that wasn't explicitly or immediately derived from the Scriptures, you have to reject that. That's not what Paul's saying. There's a particular kinds of philosophy that he's opposed to, and it's that which is not according to Christ. And we'll see that in just a moment. But Paul perfectly understands that God gave to his people two different books, we have one, the Bible. It is, it is a closed canon. It is the perfectly revealed will of God. It is, it is his special revelation. But he's also given us another book. It's the book of nature. We could call this natural law or the book of nature, and it is a legitimate book. Now, our interpretation of it is not infallible. The scriptures are the only certain, sufficient, and infallible rule of saving knowledge and practice. But, the, but it is legitimate to look to the heavens. That's what the psalmist declared in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And you know what? They're true words. They're good words. We can observe from nature. We can observe from human experience certain things. And some of those are good and, and, and very helpful to us. We ought to praise God when, when, a, when, when a surgeon is able to cut us open and, and remedy something going on inside of us, things that he has made no, or discovered by observation, by reason, by science, because the Bible didn't tell him how to do a heart transplant. So it is not all philosophies in, in total that are to be rejected. It's not all ideas from human authorities that are to be rejected. But that which is contrary to the gospel of Christ, contrary to that which is revealed in the scripture. So it's a very careful distinction we have to make, but it's an important one. And here in Colossians chapter 2, in verse 9, Paul very succinctly gives three characteristics of the kind of captivity that we must avoid. He says, we must avoid, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. And he gives three characteristics that characterize this, this concept of philosophy and empty deceit or empty deception and is according to human tradition. And, and again, this is not anything and everything that humans have observed, but this is that which is only human. This is man-centered. This is, this is the idea that says humanity is the sum total of our existence. Humanity is our priority. Preservation of man is, is the most important thing and, and nothing else matters. The one who says, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So this is what we would call humanism or secularism. It says, man is the sum total of reason and understanding. that we don't have, the, the one who denies the supernatural, the one who denies that there is a creator. Paul says, we, that, that kind of human tradition is the kind of philosophy that, that has to be avoided. In fact, not only is it avoided, you have to be take very careful pains that you're not taken captive by it. Because remember, he said before, these are plausible arguments. Some of this sounds good. Some of this will come 
veiled as an angel of light. And it's actually poison. But it will come with Jesus sprinkled on it. It will come with a Bible verse attached to it. And it's an empty deception. The second characteristic is according to the elemental principles of the world. Your, your ESV, if you're reading that, will say elemental spirits of the world. That's probably not the best translation. It's the idea of principles. Um, there are some who, who think that there were part of the heresy in, in Colossae was sort of a Gnostic heresy, so that there were, there were spirit beings that, that, that controlled the very a, various aspects of the world around them, and that was what Paul was speaking against. I don't think that's quite right. I think Paul's just simply speaking here in terms of elemental principles. In English, we would say the ABCs, something very basic. And Paul says there, there are things that, that, that are driven, or philosophies of men that are driven by just this elementary understanding of the world and, and thinking that everything is just according to those elemental principles. So here's an example. The, the, the idea that says the, the sum total of the human experience is just simply biological processes. You are just the sum total of the chemicals and the hormones and the electrical impulses in your body. There really is nothing, there's no soul. There's nothing, Im there's nothing uh, immaterial in you. Everything is material. And the whole world is just governed by those material processes. Paul says, reject that philosophy. That's not according to Christ. It's not according to the scriptures. It's this, I, that's just one example. But it's the idea that, that everything can be explained by simply natural processes. There's no place for the supernatural. There's no place for the spiritual. Paul says we have to avoid those, imp those philosophies and empty deceptions that are according to human traditions, according to elemental principles of the world, and then in a sense tying both of those together is not according to Christ. Now we're going to see as chapter 2 unfolds there, that it, is, it is very clear that there were some who were teaching the Colossians that they could grow in, in their maturity as Christians by submitting themselves to outward regulations by strict discipline of the body, for example, by submitting themselves to regulations that says don't touch, don't taste, that you have to keep certain feast days, that's how you grow as a Christian. And Paul says, those are not according to Christ because the gospel teaches that you are not only justified, but you are sanctified by the grace of God revealed in Christ Jesus, embraced by faith alone. So these are not according to to Christ. Paul says there are all kinds of philosophies that will run afoul of these characteristics that are, that are based on just merely human tradition, that are based on, on thinking through, considering the world only from a physical, biological, or, or material perspective. And thinking things that are not according to Christ, that contradict the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, is it, when I, uh, a couple weeks ago, when I, in, in verse 4, in the sermon there, someone may delude you with plausible arguments. I gave some examples that the, in, in our day, some of the more prominent ones are the ideas of, of aberrant human sexuality, that in the name of Christianity, you have to love your neighbor and be tolerant to your neighbor. So you have to, you have to not only accept those things, but promote them and call them good. And there's the idea of plausibility because the scriptures get twisted. And people will say, well, this is what it means to love your neighbor. And it's a plausible argument. But that's not according to Christ, is it? Because Christ says you must die to yourself. You must confess your sin and, be, and forsake it and flee to Christ and believe that he will, by the renewal of your mind, transform you and conform you more and more to the image of Christ. Also, with things like critical social justice and critical race theory, that will come and says, well, in order to love your neighbor, the gospel will, requires of us justice from one man to another. Therefore, we have to, to change the terms of the gospel in order to embrace these other philosophies. Well, that is not according to Christ. What does Ephesians 2 say? Ephesians 2 says that God makes one man out of the two. He doesn't divide people into various demographics and ethnicities. The whole goal of the redemption is to make one man out of every people, nation, tongue, and tribe. It's not according to Christ to say we're going to divide it all up again. We have to reject these things. And Paul wants us to resist the temptation to define Christian maturity, to define holiness in terms of the body, in terms of merely the physical or the outward or the merely legal rather than focusing on the inward transformation of man by the Spirit of Christ. 
He wants us not to be caught up in, in, in bondage to the ideas of human effort or outward conformity to rules and programs or religious traditions. Now, Paul says something very similar when he wrote to the Galatian church. Now, he had a much sharper tone there. Um, he, he begins that letter with, who has bewitched you? Um, he, he, Colossians, he's writing very gently, very tenderly uh, as a brother and a father to them. Galatians was a much sharper rebuke, but he says something very similar in Galatians 5. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand there, firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It's the same threat. There were those in Galatia who were actively promoting this, and those in, in, in apparently, apparently in Colossians, it was, not, it was not an ongoing thing inside the church, but it was a real threat that those who had begun by the grace of the gospel might be tempted to continue on by works of the law. Now remember, a key theme, a key theme that drives all the way through Colossians is the nature and the means of Christian maturity. That's what Paul says in, in verse 28 of chapter 1. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might, that we might present everyone mature in Christ. Also, this is, this is the whole aim of my, of my ministry. It's the reason I'm writing this letter to you. I want you mature in Christ. But think about this. Those who have been called out of paganism, they've embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are gathered together in this church in Colossae. They have a, they have a desire, like, like true new believers do, to ple- be pleasing to God. I want to please God. I am, I am embarrassed, I'm ashamed of the way I used to live, the way I used to think, the things that I used to do. It grieves my soul, and I want to be pleasing to God. And false teachers come along and say, oh, okay, you want to be pleasing to God. I have a list for you. I have a program for you. I have five easy steps or ten programs, whatever it is, for you to be right with God. It includes certain days that you have to celebrate. It includes a list of do, do's and do nots with respect to your diet. It, it includes all these kinds of regulations, but if you keep these strictly, this is how you'll be pleasing to God. And Paul says, avoid all of that. That's not according to Christ. Those are human traditions. They are, they are, they are based on the elemental principles of this world. If you've, if you've forsaken all of that, then why are you going back to it? That's, what, that's the argument he'll make later in chapter 2. But, but you see how for, for that new believer with a tender conscience and a sincere desire to please God, This is a particular temptation, isn't it? To say, think about the one who's fled North Korea. He doesn't know what freedom is. Now, what kind of temptations might he face? He's eager to give himself back over because those those programs, those structures, those rules feel safe, don't they? They feel more secure than freedom. Freedom's scary because freedom comes with responsibility, and it's frightening sometimes. So this is the first of three warnings. We'll see when we get to it, we'll see another one in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. There's another one in verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. There's two more warnings that we'll get to, but this is the first. So as you can see, Paul's very concerned that genuine believers with a genuine desire to please God will fall captive to these sort of man-made ideas. He's concerned that the desire of true Christians to please God will actually make them susceptible to smooth-talking, silver-tongued devils who will come in and say, this is what the gospel really is. Paul says, it's plausible. It sounds, on, when you first hear it, it sounds good because they talk about Jesus. But it's not the gospel. It's not according to Christ. So this is what he means by philosophy and empty deceit and human traditions that are not according to Christ. It's this focus on on outward and superficial and man-centered things that he will say later on, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Some of you, some of us, painfully know by experience, don't we, that the force of our will isn't sufficient to stop sin, is it? It's just not. How many times have you said, I'm I'm going to, covenant myself, purpose myself, I'm not going to I'm not gonna let my tongue get the better of me anymore. How's that working out for you? You need the grace of the gospel, don't you? You need that ongoing work of the Spirit. You need something that is according to Christ. You don't need an outside program. So, Paul's given us this warning, and, and, and brothers and sisters, we have to know, this is not just a hypothetical warning for the Colossian church. 
The very first message that I preached in the introduction to Colossians, I called it from Colossae to Conroe, because this hits right where we live and breathe and work and, and, and play and everything else, right? This is, this is us. See to it that no one takes you captive. See to it that no one takes you captive. But how, Paul? How, 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 do, I, how do I protect myself? How do I protect those, those that I love from falling into these, these captivities? How do I avoid this? And the answer is we have to understand what true freedom looks like. And Paul employs this pattern. He warns and then he teaches. He warns and then he teaches. He warns and then he teaches. That's what, he ha- that's what happens next. That's the bulk of verses 9 to 15. And, and this is why, uh, I mean, I'm going to resist the temptation to parse every word here, although I would love to do that, and, and I think it would be fruitful, but I don't want us to miss the overall point. Paul's giving them a portrait of freedom. It's almost as if he's inviting them to look out through the bars of the jail and consider what the land of the free is and live that way. A man who's never known freedom needs to have it described to him. He needs to have that picture painted for what it's like. And he's going to have a hard time believing it. He's going to have a hard time saying, is it really that way? I mean, you can really just, just travel to see Grandma in, 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 Iowa, in Iowa and you don't have to get papers from the government? You, you, can, you can literally just associate with whomever you want? You, you can go to whatever church you want? Doesn't the government have to approve the doctrine? I mean, we, in, in the homeschooling world, we face this sometimes, right? People come from other states, and we say, welcome to Texas. <laughs> but don't I have to register with the government? No. Welcome to Texas. It's free. Now, it's scary, because there's no net. But, it's, it's, but you live as free men. And people have a hard time fathoming that. They come from a place where you have to turn in your curriculum and do all these kinds of things and submit the testing, and they, and they look at you like you're crazy. You mean, there's, there's no papers? No. No, but don't have, no, just, just do what you want to do. Um, so someone who doesn't know freedom has to have it described to them because and, and, they don't naturally see it, right? He needs, that man will need patient instruction. He's going to need constant reminders. He's going to need reassurances that you're okay. It's going to be all right. So this is the picture of freedom. That's the second point. Now, I, 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 working through that North Korea illustration is obviously pretty dramatic, right? But there's another illustration that's much more common, much more frequent, and it happens kind of sometimes without our knowing it in our neighborhoods. And that is people who've been incarcerated for many years, and now they're, they're removed. Their, their sentence has been served. Maybe they're out on parole or they've served their full sentence. They've been in, in prison for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and now they're told, you're free. Go live as free men. And they don't know how. They don't know how. Technology has changed. The world has changed. They don't know how. They've been told what, when to eat, what to eat, when to go to the bathroom, when to sleep, when to exercise. They don't know. The idea of choosing for themselves is frightening and overwhelming. So there are all kinds of, of programs and organizations that will help teach men and women to, to leave the prison system and how to help reintegrate them into society without going back, without reoffending. And often, those groups will use a sort of, you know, they call them halfway houses or other terms, but it's the idea of, of, of still a communal living with other outward structures in order to ease that transition because, again, freedom is scary. And they'll provide a rigid structure and rules while attempting to, to reacclimate men and women to personal responsibility, uh, to the requirements that come with freedom. Now, sadly, many of us as Christians have spent time in sort of spiritual halfway houses. We, we've not really known what freedom was. We, we were put in a place where this is, okay, you've become a Christian, now submit yourself to, to our program so that you can learn what freedom is. And what's happened is that kind of legalism and moralism ends up stunting the growth of Christians, and they don't know how to live as free men. And Paul now is eager to equip the Colossian Christians to avoid such captivity, and he wants to paint for them and for us what it looks like. So let's look together at verses 9 to 15, and again, um, <laughs> 
it's, it's interesting, as I did the exegetical work, I, I, I built a chart. And so in your mind, maybe, if, you, if you're a visual person, there's two columns. There's a left and a right. And, and on one side is Christ's person and work. This is the work of God. And on the other side is the benefits to the Christian. And, and as you see, as you go through this, they just fall left and right, left and right, left and right. Paul takes you. Here's what freedom is. Here's the work of God. Here's the benefit to you who are free in Christ. Here's the work of God. Here's another benefit to you who are free in Christ. So let's just go in order. Not exhaustively, but let's go in order. Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. Now think about the image. Paul has already alluded multiple times to the temple. We saw that even last week. The idea of a mixed metaphor of, of a tree deeply rooted and the metaphor of a firm foundation, well, those come together in the garden. The Garden of Eden was a temple. It was a place of worship. It had, it had a covenant. It had sacraments, the tree of life. It had the presence of God. It had ordinances. It was a place of worship. It had a command to Adam, the high priest, to fill that garden with worshipers. So you had the idea of trees and a, f- a foundation of a temple there. So Paul's alluded to that already. Well, there's another allusion here. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity, literally, it tabernacles. He tabernacles with us. Now, you remember the story when Solomon built the temple. He oversaw the building of the temple, and then Solomon dedicated thousands and thousands of animals, bulls and rams and goats and every, the, whole, the whole thing, thousands of them. Imagine how much blood was shed that day. He dedicated the temple. Solomon prayed. And what happened next? The glory of the Lord filled the temple. And and to the Israelite, this this was the focus of their entire life, was that the Spirit of God filled the temple of the living God. And everything they did, they even prayed in that direction. Everything they did revolved around the temple. And, and, And even more specifically, that holy place, because the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, was inside the most holy place. And only their high priest was able to go in there and him only once a year. That was the focus of their identity. Here Paul says something that's mind-blowing. Again, this could, be, this could be a whole sermon series. In him, the whole fullness of deity tabernacles bodily. In the present tense, Jesus is the Old Testament. or He is, he is the end times temple that was foretold to us. The full measure of deity, the full godness of God dwells bodily, tabernacles bodily with us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, and you have been filled in him. He tabernacles not just with us corporately, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you individually also are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And as a, as a consequence, he warns us against sexual immorality and other things because what we do in our body matters because the temple, we are a temple, the Holy Spirit. So you see the picture here, it's a rich picture. He says, the fullness of the deity tabernacles with us. You want to know what freedom is? You, you, don't be taken captive to someone comes along and peddles to you something about, well, you've got to keep a certain feast day to be pleasing to God. Paul said, really? The whole the whole some total of who God is tabernacles with you already. And, and you want to go say it depends on what you eat? Or when you go and what place? Don't, don't, don't be taken captive by that because you know this is what real freedom is. But look at the next phrase. He says Christ is, um, the second half of verse 10, who, Christ is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Christ is the head of all rule and authority. Paul had already established for us in verse 18 of chapter 1, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. All authorities, whether visible, invisible, in heaven or on earth, all authorities are underneath him. And and Paul's essentially saying... you're thinking about these plausible arguments, these who would come to you with human philosophies, the empty deception of man-made religion and tell you 
that you need something else to govern you, something else to rule. You already are underneath the head. The one who is the rule and sovereign over all things. As we looked at Daniel chapter 7 in Sunday school, he is the son of man who comes and who's been handed the kingdom by the ancient of days. We don't need uh, another sovereign over us. We have the king of kings. We have the Lord of lords. And Paul says, in him, the one who has all rule and authority, in him you were also circumcised without hands. Now what does that mean? Jehovah, Yahweh is the one who gave to Abraham the ordinance of circumcision, the covenant. It was a blood, literally a blood covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham. What Paul's saying is, you have a better covenant. God, in the person of his son, has struck a better covenant with you. Not because he circumcised the foreskin of your flesh, because he circumcised your heart. This is the freedom you already have. You already have the mark. You don't need other things that are far less significant than what Christ has already done in you by his Spirit's work. Then, the next phrase, he says, verse 11, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, this is, this is a graphic allusion. Paul here is not talking about the fleshly circumcision that our Savior endured according to the law on the eighth day after his birth. Mary and Joseph certainly would have taken him and had him circumcised according to the law. The scripture tells us that, that in all those, in every jot and tittle of the law, he was perfect. That's not what this is a reference to. The idea of Christ's circumcision here is a reference to his bloody crucifixion. His whole body, not just the foreskin, his whole body was cut off for you and for me. And because of that, because his whole body is cut off, our body of flesh is now put off. You see, that's the image. Christ's entire body is cut off, and the consequence of that is our flesh. The sin that so easily ensnares us, the power of, of, of the flesh, is cut off. It doesn't mean the sin is already gone. We know that. We still live with indwelling sin. But the power of sin is canceled. It's broken. It's cut off. The next phrase, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And here once again, this, this could be a reference to our Lord's baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist. But I don't think that's what it, what it means here. There's some, some of our Presbyterian brothers have really tried hard to twist this text and connect circumcision and baptism. That's not the point. Paul's not anywhere near that point. Paul's making the point that our, our Lord's burial after his death is, was a baptism. He was baptized into a death. He drank a cup that we could not drink. He drank the full measure of God's wrath that we could never drink. And in that way, Christ was baptized. And because of his baptism, God, and God raised him from the dead, we also were raised with him. We were raised to walk in newness of life. You see, there's so much vivid imagery here. There's so many pictures here worthy of our meditation and our, and our, and our thoughtfulness. God has done all of these things. So Paul warns us about being taken captive by philosophies and empty deception, which are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, having my notes, um, I, I intended to spend some time in the 21st chapter of our confession of faith on, on, on Christian liberty, on the liberty of conscience. For the sake of time, I will commend that to you. Um, but there are three, there are three paragraphs. In the, in the first two paragraphs, that simply assert that Christ alone is Lord of the conscience. There can be no other. And we are to reject the doctrines and commandments of men. In fact, not only is it, is it con if we submit ourselves in blind faith to these things, not only is it contrary to the liberty that Christ has purchased, but it's against reason also. And then just in case we think, well, Paul's promoting a sort of um, libertinism, he's not. And when we get to chapter 3 of Colossians, you'll see for yourself that's not the case at all. Um, Paul is very clear about what the Christian life ought to look like in holiness. And, and the third paragraph in chapter 21 of our confession corresponds to that. There's a warning. Anyone who would, under the pretense of Christian liberty, would indulge any sin doesn't understand Christian liberty. 
So I would commend that to you um, just in your devotional reading. Uh, read through chapter 21 in our confession and think about it in the context here of, of the overall argument that Paul's making. That those who would come and give you doctrines of men according to human traditions, according to the elemental principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Think about the, the assault that that is on what Christ has purchased for his people. So Paul paints for the, a picture for the Colossian Christians, and, and for us, a picture now of what true freedom looks like. That the, that the fullness of deity tabernacles with us, that, that Christ is the head of all rule and authority, and because of that, we've been circumcised with a circumcision that didn't, wasn't accomplished by human hands. That Christ's circumcision, the cutting off of his body, has resulted in the cutting off of the body of flesh, that we can live in righteousness to him. His burial and baptism has resulted in God raising him from the dead, which has the effect of us being raised with him to walk in newness of life. That's the freedom. That's the picture that Christ wants us to, to look out through the bars and see. This is what the land of freedom looks like. But he doesn't stop there. He points us to the key to preserve our freedom in Christ and our freedom for Christ. We see this go back, back up a little bit. Verse 12, he says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. The key, the key to freedom is faith in the powerful working of God. And it is the key not only for our justification, our original, our original being um, loosed from the bondage of our sin and misery. But it is the key to our sanctification as well. It is by the same virtue, by the same grace of the gospel that we are sanctified in the truth, that we are matured in Christian growth. It is by the instrument of faith that we are justified by God, and it's also the means of faith in the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. It's, it's by that same means that we're sanctified. We're, by, by that same faith, we are made more and more holy before God. It is by that same faith that we are preserved until the Lord turn, returns or until he calls us home. We sang earlier um, this morning the, that hymn, the modern hymn uh, by Keith Getty, In Christ Alone, in the last stanza, says, No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell nor scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That's the key. That's the key to our captivity. And some of us, it's as if we're sitting in a jail cell and all along, on a string around our neck has been the key. And we've not put it in the lock and turned it. It is by faith in the powerful working of God that we are delivered. It is not in, in these outward ordinances and outward, and outward things that, that some will say, if you, just, if you just avoid certain things, here's the list. If you do certain things, and here's the list, you, you, you will be right on track in your growth in the maturity. Or even come along and say, well, this is what a mature Christian looks like. He does not do this, and he does this. That's what maturity looks like. Don't be taken captive by that idea. Understand the key here to freedom. There remains an ever-present temptation to employ some other power in our growth into Christian maturity. Isn't that the case? We will freely admit, okay, I was justified based on the power of God. But I need some help with this other source of power for my growth in godliness, for my sanctification. Don't fall for it. That's a trap. It's a, it's a form of captivity. There will always be some teacher who promises a method, a program, a series of disciplines that will harness your human power to grow in righteousness. And that, isn't that the key? Isn't that every other religion in the world? That, that, that's, that's every form of, of, that's every cult that claims Christianity. That's Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and, all, and Roman Catholicism and all those that say, this is your growth. You harness human power and that's how you'll grow. I mean, there's a measure of Jesus there too, I mean, but, but it's, it's, it's human power. 
You see, it's a plausible argument. It's a human tradition. It sounds good, but it's really fundamentally no different than Islam or Buddhism or Confucianism or anything else. It's harnessing human power to say this is how we'll grow. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive by such teaching. You need, and, and I need, the powerful working of God in Jesus Christ to deliver us. To deliver us from ourselves, to deliver us from sin, to deliver us daily from the idea that you can fix yourself. I mean, just think about this. As you, as you struggle with the, the, the sin that remains, there's a particular temptation that you face. Where are you going for the strength to fight that temptation? Are you doubling down and think, I just need more willpower? I, I need more of me. I need more of something external in order to constrain and, 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 and coerce me. Paul says, no, what you need is faith in the powerful working of God. That's what's needed. But again, that doesn't mean we're not striving and straining and toiling. We are. That's the nature of sanctification. But in whose power are we doing it? That's the question. Isn't this what Paul said in, in back in chapter 1 or verse 29? For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That was, that was Paul's understanding. That he couldn't do anything in his own strength. It's also what he said when we studied the, the letter to the Philippian church in chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is the faith in the powerful working of God. That's the key. That's the key to avoiding being taken captive by these philosophies and empty deceptions. And, and this is also what he warned the Galatian church about. Galatians 3, O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Here in, in, in the closing verses of our, of our passage today, Paul says in verse 13, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of, of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Again, another vivid imagery, another vivid image. At the crucifixion of Christ, it was common for the Romans to, to have a plaque above the cross that stated the charges. You remember Pilate wrote, king of the Jews. And the Pharisees and the Jews protested. That wasn't quite accurate. We want him to say, he said this. And Pilate said, I wrote what I wrote. It stands. But that was the custom. Here's the image. All of your sin, all of my sin, was written on that plaque. The full legal requirement, the full certificate of debt, every charge, every, everything that we've ever done was written on that plaque, nailed to the cross. And Jesus said, it's finished. The debt is paid. This was by the powerful working of God. And you're going to go back to the law? You're going to go back to, to regulations about food and think that trumps what Christ did? It, it, again, it doesn't, doesn't even stand up to the test of sound reason, does it? That's the nature of, of Christian liberty. Is this is what it means to be free and, and to violate that freedom and then to submit yourself again in blind obedience to all these external things is to say the powerful working of God isn't enough and that's not even a reasonable position. So brothers and sisters, will you hear and heed the warning given to you today by the word of God? And will you seek to live as free men and women under the rule and reign of King Jesus. Look what Paul says in verse 15. This is, this is, this is just mind-blowing and, and a marvelous image to, to have the Spirit of God paint on your brain. 
he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. As we look at Daniel 7 today, there's this picture of, of the Ancient of Days sitting in a flaming chariot. And here's this one horn that's conquered the other horns, and he's mouthing to God. And the text just in one short verse just says, he was destroyed. Christ, having been raised from the dead, put his enemies to open shame. He triumphed over them. He's, he's, he's fulfilled what was said in Psalm 2. God in heaven laughs at those who would mock him. So think carefully about these things. And again, I would commend to you verses 9 through 15 to, to, to read back through them carefully. Um, Make your own chart. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a helpful exercise. Think through. Here's what Christ has done. Here's the work of God. Here's the benefit to me. And write those down. It, it's helpful just, or maybe at least in my brain it is, to see it. See how it's organized there. But then to think, as you struggle even with a particular sin, do you, do you think more about your, your human willpower to deliver you? You think about your own, how do I harness my own power here? Or maybe how do I harness the collective power of others around me to solve my problem, rather than I'm, I'm, I'm being delivered here by the powerful working of God. Meditate upon the picture of freedom that Paul paints for us, and we'll see this unfold more and more as the chapter progresses. But these are glorious, marvelous truths uh, to behold, that uh, what, what God has done in Christ, making new creations of you and me. And then I want to add... Uh, to the unbeliever, to those who are here, who, who don't even understand what this freedom looks like, who can't comprehend. I mean, you're, you're like the prisoner who's been in, in prison for all of his life, and you can't comprehend what life is like outside the bars. You, you're you're the, 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 the person who's grown up in North Korea who's just been constantly brainwashed about what reality is, and you can't comprehend what it's like to breathe the air of freedom. The only way you'll ever know that is by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just, not only to forgive you of your sin, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Today is the day of salvation. So I'd urge you, young people, hear, hear this. Think about these things. It, it, it may sound like this is, this is distant and remote to your life, but this, this is everything. We have been offered true freedom in Christ. And as, as young people, as you think about it, you hear on the news and you hear things about communism and tyranny and, and oppression and, and all these kinds of things, these ideas, and those are real and serious threats. But nothing, nothing, nothing in this world is more important, more serious than the bondage of your own sin, the bondage of your own nature. And only Christ can set you free from that. Flee to him. He's promised to receive you. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the mercy that you have given to us in Christ our Lord. You have humbled us with the magnanimity of your grace and mercy. We, we cannot comprehend. One day, when we see you face to face and as we know you as we are now known, one day we will see the full sinfulness of our sin and the full, the full measure of the mercy by which you have delivered us. But we, we give you thanks for the light that we have. And we pray that you will help us to walk in freedom. Not for our own, not to indulge our flesh, not for our own purposes, but to live as free men for the glory of Christ and for the good of our brothers and sisters. We pray that you will teach us to depend by faith on the powerful working of God within us and for that same power working in and among our brothers and sisters in this place. And we pray that you, by that power you will, will unify us more and more, that you will cause us to grow together in our love, our holiness, our devotion to you. We ask this for Christ's namesake. Amen.